But if somebody that you encounter says, hey, you know, I really need some prayer and I don't know who to talk to or I'm not sure what to say about it or I, I don't really want it to become public. Um, when people send an, uh, a prayer request through the web page or through the app, it just goes right to our, our inbox. And the only two people that see uh, the email is myself and Lisa. And so that stays very close hold. We don't we don't share that. Um, it's no one else's business, of course. Now, if they want to share it, then they certainly are welcome to do that. But it's their information, not ours. And so I've found that it's encouraging for people um, to know that if they need to talk about something that's very close and personal to them, that they have a resource. And so I just uh, mentioned that uh, for you there as well. <coughs> Um, also, um, I don't know of too many other outside prayer requests, but I will ask you uh, to pray for me. I need to go back to the eye doctor, and that's kind of funny to say because I was just there uh, to get new glasses, and things are blurry again. And apparently, this happens when you get old. There's a, I'm not kidding, you know, I go to these doctors, and I think they are just flagrant in their description of things. Because, you know, they're all in their 30s and they just get a kick out of making fun of the next de decade. But apparently there's this mystical line that happened that you cross when you're 40 years old. And my eyes were fine a few months ago and now they're fuzzy again. And so some of you, I think maybe you'll do this on purpose now that you know the further away you are, now the blurrier you are. So if you mock me, pick on me, disagree with what I'm saying, I really can't tell now. So if you think I'm talking, I can still see that, Sophia Leanne. I'll tell you that right now. I saw that. I can see your attitude a mile away. She's my daughter. If you're watching online, it's okay. She sasses me right back. I've done that in front of people that don't know we're related and they think I'm a horrible person, which I might be, but you get away with more when you're related. So pray for my eyesight and, uh, I will not do the guy thing. I will actually make an appointment and go down there and be seen. So uh, I would appreciate that. Uh, anybody else? Hopefully with a slightly less humorous malady. Oh, good. Now the hands go up. Yes. All right. Lynn, I'm nearsighted, so I saw you first. Uh, pray for our daughter's husband, Andrew, returning very soon. Pray for him. Okay. I did see that, and, it, and it, it'll be here rapidly within the next 20 days. Yes, so um, I know that that will affect uh, their travel um, here and the luggage and uh, all sorts of fun stuff. So it's never it's never easy. But uh, if there's something that we can do to help, we're certainly certainly uh, open and willing. And you'll get to meet the Beemans. That's who uh, they're talking about, uh, Missionaries of Zambia. They will be staying in our prophet's chamber and kind of using this as their central point of... Uh, uh, help me out here. They're going to be using this as their headquarters to go other places. I can't think about it in civilian terms. I don't know how to explain that. So um, just... It's just, it's gone. I don't know. There's some things you just lose after 20 something years. So um, that's what they're going to be doing. We're going to be a blessing. We're going to try to be a blessing to them. So we appreciate that. Tara, I think that's your hand that I saw way in the back. Okay. Mm hmm. Mm. Ugh. Okay. All right. Is that is that Anthony? Okay. So I thought. Okay. Pray for Avery and her upcoming appointment. And Anthony and his dental surgery tomorrow. Okay. Yes, Stephanie. Yeah, I'd say so. She's got her 
got her work cut out for her. And please, please remind me of her name. Down. No, you're fine. I, I saw the Facebook um, update, but I, I I couldn't recall her name. So Donna, who's a missionary of the Central African Republic, um, is struggling with malaria. Quincy. Okay. So pray for Alicia. You should sink, who's also not feeling well. She's going to feel even worse when she realizes that she missed tacos at the teen event. If she's watching, she's going to be very disappointed. She'll probably turn me off. Anybody else? Oh, yes, Becca. That's right. Okay, because infusions start on Friday. That's for her uh, Crohn's. Anybody else? Of course, continue to pray for Bryson. Oh, yes, Sophia. Ooh. Mm. And And... How am I? How am I supposed to? What What is your prayer request? Because I know y'all need prayer. All right, play well. Hmm. Climb every mountain. Anyone else? No, no, no. Okay. All right. So, um, just to recap, uh, pray for Andrew. Uh, as he returns from deployment for the demons as they travel and their luggage issues, Avery and her upcoming appointment, Anthony is in his dental surgery, Donna um, struggling with malaria, Quincy tests and quizzes and his illness, and Alicia, um, her illness as well. Boy, this is how well I think I wrote Taco next to her name on the prayer request. That's, she needs a taco, everyone. That's what God is sovereign, and he just, that's, that's the prayer request. So hopefully she can get some tacos and feel well enough to eat that taco, okay? All right, I need I need to start drinking coffee in the afternoons on Wednesdays. Becca is having an infusion starting on Friday, Bryson and uh, basketball, and they need help. I mean, they need prayer, so pray for them. And um, find a prayer partner, we'll come back in a few minutes.
Page number 30 in your hymnal. Page number 30, three zero. Nothing but the blood. Let's stand as we sing. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, Oh, precious is the blood that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon of this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, Nothing but the blood of Jesus on that last stanza. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Thank you. you may be seated. We're in First John tonight. Finish the end of chapter two. And I'll tell you, we're going to talk about some interesting things, scripturally and practically, about cult. And in my robust research. I found lots of puns. Oh my goodness. It was, uh, they were so much, but they were so bad, y'all. They were so, I mean, I, I know I don't have many limits when it comes to bad dad jokes, but I found them. And so I actually had included them, and then I was reviewing for my message. I said, no, they're just, they're not wrong or inappropriate. They're just dumb. They were just so bad. <laughs> they were just so bad. Um, just, man, they were really a stretch. So I will tell you, you will get more substance tonight than what I originally intended. And that is an amazing thing. So we're in 1 John chapter 2. We're going to read beginning of verse 26 and go down. The end of the chapter is just right there in verse 29. And we'll see what the Lord has in store for us here. <clears throat> the Bible says, These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If ye know that he is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Tonight's message is spiritual safeguards against seducing spirits. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love and your truth. God, guide us into your wisdom. Help us to be discerning and to walk circumspectly. Help us, Lord, to take this information and to be uh, able to apply it to help ourselves, to help others as well. Be glorified in this message, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. America alone has over 350 sects and cults, most of which claim that their doctrines are based on the Word of God, the Bible, the book that you hold in your hands. 
And then in this passage in 1 John, we've already explored how John imparted a sense of urgency by reminding us that we're living in a type of time. He calls it the time of the end or the latter times. And, and we know that that's not just a time period, but it's a kind of time in which people will disavow themselves from sound doctrine, from healthy biblical truth. And when they turn away from that, as a part of this time, they will give heed to false teachings, those seducing spirits, and uh, value and become what John calls the spirit of Antichrist. Now, those false teachers mostly start out in biblical churches, but they deny the faith and they depart the fellowship. Now, in our last message, we surmised that we must know our Bible well enough to know and distinguish between right and wrong, between truth and error, to know what right looks like, and then to walk circumspectly, to be wise, to keep our head on a swivel, so to speak, to make sure that we know what truth looks like and avoiding all error. Now, as we conclude this chapter, John's going to help us see that false teachers try to deceive the faithful. They will indeed try to deceive professing Christians. Now, it would be one thing if false teachers were content to just keep to themselves. That's bad enough as it is, but if they just kept to themselves, then they wouldn't really be too much of a threat. But they're not content to just stay close to themselves. The real tragedy is that they earnestly try to convert others to their anti-Christian doctrines. And this is the third mark of someone who has turned away from the truth. It's interesting, if you were to observe these groups, very rarely do they try to make a quote-unquote evangelistic push. They really don't try to go make new converts from the unconverted. They really do target those that are professing Christians. They spend a lot of their time going after people who are faithful. And if we see in our text here, right in the beginning of verse number 26, John uses an interesting word. He uses the word seduce. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. Now, the word seduce carries the idea of being led astray or to be led away by something. Paul also gives us an understanding of this time, and he explains a little bit of the how they go about seducing people. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, Paul explains this. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and teachings of demons. Teachings of demons. <laughs> These seducing spirits. Now, this really shouldn't surprise us, and I might say that a couple of times, because if you know your Bible, you know that Satan himself was called the father of lies by Jesus in John chapter 8 and verse 84. The devil, his purpose is to lead Christians astray by teaching them false doctrines. And so, seducing occurs, and this happens in normal, conservative, orthodox, Baptist churches. Let me give you a story, one that's close to home for us, but I hope it hits, I hope it hits the same way for you. There's a gal by the name of Sarah B., and she moved to Florida to get a new start on life. And she moved in with my sister-in-law, and she was really committed to being, uh, to rededicating her life to the Lord Jesus Christ, growing spiritually, and she was off and running. She was doing a very great job. In fact, she stayed around, and about the year mark, she had really made some great decisions, and she was enjoying sound, solid, biblical truth. In fact, she was going to the church that we had attended, that we had att attended for years and years, and things were going really well. She was enjoying godly fellowship, uh, enjoying preaching, and as uh, she continued to grow, of course, she developed a greater appetite. She was hungering and thirsting for, for more. One of her co-workers recommended that she listen to some sermons um, from a church in Wisconsin. And we listened to a couple of them. They were, they were okay. And I don't mean in style or preference or anything like that. They were, they were okay. It just seemed like something was off. 
Now we couldn't quite put our finger on it. Have you ever thought about something like that? You're like, you know, something, something just doesn't seem right here. I don't, I don't know what it is. I haven't made any blatant or overt statements, but it just, it, it, it just seems a little bit off. And so, as it turns out, all right, that this church started to single out young single adults, both men and women, and they were extremely loving. They loved on her, they accepted her, they encouraged her in ways that she felt were unprecedented in her life. And she decided to give this church a try. I don't know if I mentioned this, but this church was in Wisconsin. Now, I'm not a geography major, but that is literally across the country, all right, just from south to north. <laughs> and she gets on the plane and she goes out there and she's interviewed by families who had been established in that church because, as we came to find out, they were looking for a spiritual wife. A spiritual wife. Are you picking up what I'm putting down? Okay. There were interviews going on. And to make it blatantly clear, this was a polygamous cult masquerading as a church. She decided to go. She was baptized by immersion, because, you know, that's the only way to do it. <laughs> and we never heard from her again. I, I kid you not. It's been, it's been over 10 years. My friends, don't think this can't happen to you. <laughs> Don't think it can't happen in good, solid Baptist churches. This was a church that was running people in the hundreds, bus ministry. It celebrated its 50, 50th year anniversary in that area. And it had a Bible college. It, it, it was a center of conservatism. And yet, seducing spirits came in. Now, I will tell you, this can happen. This can happen anywhere. Please don't get the under don't don't get the idea as many people do that th that these are just crazy people that they're just psychologically messed up and they're just you know mental and that's it uh, because studies have shown by the way that really only a third of cultists have some sort of psychological distress not diagnosed disorder but distress and it turns out that anybody under the right conditions can actually become a prime target for a cult. Now think about it. Cults really don't want unpredictable people. They already have one of those. He's the cult leader, okay? They don't need anybody else over there. They need people that are gonna go out, do what they're told, give them money, and try to help that cult reach their goal. Relatively healthy people going through stressful periods become prime targets. Now we'll tease this out a little bit. Research and analysis of cults have actually shown that all of this boils down to four manipulative tactics that they use to seduce, to use John's word, to seduce other people. Knowing these things can help us prevent ourselves and one another from being sucked into their cult, their scams, and other extreme organizations that they're out there. Now, the first tactic, and these are sequential, this is step by step. Now, if you're taking these notes in order to start your cult, please leave immediately, all right? You can get all of this through your own research. I'm not doing your dirty work for you. <clears throat> now, back to Dignified Joe. Tactic number one is that they pick the right target. As it turns out, most people uh, can be susceptible to cult influence under the right conditions. Again, research has shown that people are susceptible to recruitment when they're stressed, emotionally vulnerable, they have tenuous or no family connections, and they're living in a bad economic situation. Living paycheck to paycheck. They don't have a lot of money. They're in debt. They're in the wrong part of town. They live on the wrong side of the tracks, etc., etc. Interestingly enough, new college students are actually prime targets. And here's why. Um, they're still forming their identity. They don't quite know who they are or why they do what they do. And they've been recently separated from their family. So they don't have a lot of strong, loving, emotional connections there to help them. And another interesting demographic is the people that have been neglected, 
or abused as children are also easily recruited because they crave the validation that the cultists are more than willing to give to them. In some communities, especially I noticed this in Tampa, um, some groups are targeted based off of their ethnicity or their language. If a segment of society has been marginalized from the community or from the church, they crave that connection to other human beings. And in Tampa, it was the Jehovah's Witnesses that targeted Spanish-speaking people. Um, the Spanish culture was very strong in Tampa, but it was, it was a minority uh, it was a minority culture. And one of the best things that we did um, at Tampa uh, was to start a Spanish ministry. Now, we didn't start it to ward off the cultists, although that was a, a tertiary benefit of having that there because it gave people a place to connect. I remember we were, we were, uh, we were at home one day and uh, actually at my, at my in-law's house and we um, had a knock at the door and it was the Spanish-speaking Jehovah's Witnesses. And they didn't want to talk to me. And they didn't want to talk to Lisa. We did not speak Spanish. All right. Um, so they asked specifically if a Spanish speaking person was at home. Well, we had Beth, who, as you know, is a missionary to Peru. She speaks Spanish amazingly. And she shows up and starts talking to Sp in Spanish. And it didn't take them long to go, now, wait a minute. <laughs> You're not the kind of Spanish we're looking for. That's what they said. They want someone who is disconnected from the community, feels alienated so they can love on them. And that's actually the next tactic. After they pick the right person, there's a tactic that's called love bombing. And that's a word that came from the Moonies, another cult that came on the scene. You can research them all day long. I'll, let you, I'll leave you to that. Love bombing uh, involves taking this vulnerable target and then flooding that person with affection, flattery, validation. They're trying to make people feel special and unique, that they're your long lost best friend and they um, approach you to make you think that uh, everything th that you've ever wanted in a friend is right there waiting for you. They've been known to fake mutual interests uh, to give the impression that you have many things in common. And so they also uh, have been known, uh, especially on college campuses, to wait outside counseling centers um, because they will poach troubled students and offer them the emotional comfort that they would otherwise get from a trained professional that's there in the counseling center. It's, uh, it's, it's amazing. I, I don't want to harp too much on the college thing, but I, I found a lot of interesting things uh, regarding that because... There have been other evangelistic, let me back that up. There have been other Christian organizations on campus that have noticed the same problems. Um, if you've uh, heard of uh, Campus Crusade for Christ or just Campus Crusade, um, they're one of the biggest Christian organizations on colleges and universities across America. And they noticed this problem as well, and they wanted to do something about it. So. They did a couple of things. They hosted an event called Campus Cults Summit Conference. Just put it right out there. <laughs> What's this event going to be about? I don't know. Let's name it something obvious. The Campus Cult Summit Conference. All right. And they organized this event with nine other Christian um, organizations on campus in order to approach those who had been actively recruited or even subtly influenced by the cult on campus. They even went so far to create a, a campus cult resource kit. And they did that because there were cults actively addressing them. The names of these cults. They are called, trans, uh, some of them practice transcendental meditation. One is called the Unification Church, the Children of God, the Way, that's pre-Mandalorian for those of you that are concerned, and the local church. The Children of God, the Way, the local church. These are all biblical, authentically biblical statements and concepts and titles. Do you see how confusing this should be? And after they target this person and they love bomb them and they get them together, 
and, and, and try to influence them in that way, the next step is to isolate them. They've got to get them away. So they're enticing the recruit with approval, the promise of some fulfilling understanding of the universe, because who doesn't want to understand the ins and outs, ins and outs of that? And then they will try to isolate that person. Now, this usually looks like a weekend retreat, all right? Especially the all expenses paid kind. They will get this person isolated so they can indoctrinate them with their ideology, isolate them further from friends and family members who might otherwise talk sense into them, and they will usually cut off all sources of information, TV, news, things like that, because they have to substitute what we know of as reality with their fabricated reality. They have to present an image of what the world really is like, quote unquote. Which leads to the last step, tactic number four, is keeping control, and that's usually by controlling the narrative, by shaping the way that they see reality, what they think about reality, and how they behave as a result of the way that they see and think about reality. They'll convince this person, again, that they're best friends, that they are loved and accepted and nourished, and then they'll get them off to the side where they can talk about their ideology, and then they got to hang on to them. Now, there's a lot of ways that you can do this, but usually it comes by combining two key things, a sense of terror and a sense of love. As polar opposite as those two seem, they actually go hand in glove. Um, there's a psychologist, Alexandra Stein, that explained that when people are frightened, they don't simply run away from fear, they run to a safe haven. And sometimes that is a someone, that is they run to someone who's going to help them in the time of that crisis. It's someone to whom they feel attached, someone that they think is safe. The problem in cults is that when they feel safe, they also are terrified, meaning the cult is the source of their fear. And they need to get away. They don't know how to get away. And everyone is telling them all sorts of uh, all all sorts of untruth. From if you leave, you'll go to hell. So now your eternity hinges on your allegiance to this organization. Not merely your sanity, not merely your connection with friends and family that you've long forsaken, but your your eternal realities are now on the line. So you're scared to death to leave. But you, you know that you have to, but then they approach you and re-approach you with a sense of love and acceptance. And, and so psychologically, people are stuck between avoidance and approach, meaning that they would approach someone to help them get out. They're just kind of in this permanent status of freezing. They just don't know where to go. They just don't know what to do. So they are stuck. Now, people have broken out of these situations, and usually it's because they find someone else that's fed up with the system. And they pocket themselves together and they become the dissenting voices, and if they're strong enough and courageous enough, they will find a way to break free out of that and find a way to come back to what we know of as objective reality. Does that sound satanic to you? It should because this is where it comes from. Again, I repeat, now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and teachings of demons. As John tells us and warns us, they are seducing people to believe their lies. It is absolutely satanic, and they latch on to major doctrines of Christianity and try to figure that in. In fact, some cult leaders have strong personalities that honestly believe that they are a savior or a messiah. Everything from the Branch Davidians to ones that you've probably never heard of, like the Colonial Village Church in Flint, Michigan. Several years after their leader died in 1974, the members of this church still awaited his return because before he died, a year before he died, he gave a prophecy 
that he was one of the two witnesses mentioned in the book of Revelation. And he died a year later in 1974. And the members of that church for two years held a 24-hour vigil waiting for his return. That's messianic, the second coming. And it would go on for another two years. The church finally dissolved in 1978. Now, we shouldn't be too surprised. We can be astounded. It's absurd. But as Paul affirmed in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11, we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. We know how he likes to work. And the truth is, Satan is not an originator. He is a counterfeiter. He imitates the work of God. He has counterfeit ministers, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, who preach a counterfeit gospel, according to Galatians chapter 1, that produce counterfeit Christians, according to John chapter 8, who depend on counterfeit righteousness, according to Romans chapter 10. In the parable of the, of the tares, Jesus warned us right off the bat in Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30. He told us that Jesus and Satan are both pictured as sowers. And Jesus sows the true seed, and those create the children of God. But Satan creates the children of the wicked one. And these two kind of plants, which while they're growing, are virtually indistinguishable. It's hard to tell them apart. They're even bearing fruit. And if we borrow from our studies in, uh, in Isaiah, it's not about whether there's fruit or not. It's whether there's uh, righteous, luscious, godly fruit, or if there's sour grapes. And there's lots of sour grapes, but it's so indistinguishable between the way some Christians live their life and the way non-Christians profess to live their life. Satan's chief strategy, if we learn anything from the parable of the tares, is that he's going to plant counterfeit Christians wherever Christ has planted the true. Does that include here? Are there true Christians practicing biblical Christianity in this church? Then we're a target. So it's important to be able to detect and separate the true teachings of Jesus Christ from the false teachings. If John wrote to his church family, the little children, and he's writing to our church family as well. Now, how do we avoid this calamity? By establishing two spiritual safeguards against seducing spirits. The first one is easy. First, to reiterate, we know the truth. Go back to verse number 21, and we'll read there again. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. It's a used illustration, but it is still a useful illustration to say that the FBI trains their agents to identify counterfeit bills by training them to know thoroughly the authentic bills. So if we know the authentic truth, then it will be much easier to identify the counterfeit ones. Now, the second reality, the second safeguard that we must uh, adhere to is by depending on the teaching of the Holy Spirit. And this is found in verse number 27. That the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you. And you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Now, every believer has experienced the anointing. Remember from verse 20 in our previous study, that is an unction. That's an anointing of the Spirit. And the Spirit is the one that teaches us truth. False teachers are not led by a spirit of truth. They are led by a spirit of error. We'll study that more in 1 John chapter 4. Now, we are warned against letting a man be our teacher. And you're like, oh, good, because it's getting time. Just go ahead and sit down now. Why have you been talking to us for so long? <clears throat> well, if I may. All right. God has indeed given us the spirit to teach us his truth. This does not deny the office of human teachers in the church. 
or else we have to ignore, you know, the entirety of Ephesians chapter 4. But it does mean that under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we all must test the teaching of men to make sure that they are teaching the Bible. Okay, here's a good example for you. A missionary to the American Indians was in Los Angeles with an Indian friend of his. And they're Christians, and they're walking around, and while they're walking through the streets of L.A., there's a gentleman with a Bible preaching on the side of the street. Now, the missionary could see that this man was a member of a cult, but he knew that his friend had not been exposed to these things before. So he's a little curious to see what would happen, but he's praying. Like, oh, man, I hope this guy doesn't listen. So the, his friend goes over, and he's listening. He's listening. He's kind of taking things in, and then at a certain point, just walks back away. And the missionary says, so, um, so what would you think of all that? And he goes, well, I was really interested because here's a man with a Bible preaching on the street corner. But there was something, there was something inside me that as I listened to him speak, something kept saying, liar, liar. And the truth is, that's not a something. That's a someone. Someone is the Holy Spirit confirming in his, in his heart that this is error, that this person is speaking error. See, the Spirit helps us identify truth from error. So as we listen to men, myself included, you should consider, is what he's saying true? Is it lining up with the Scriptures? Is, is he really teaching authentic biblical Christianity, or should I be concerned? Because we want to abide in the Spirit, verse 27 tells us. Why are Christians led astray? Because they don't abide in the Spirit. To abide simply means to remain in fellowship. And fellowship is the whole idea of these first two chapters. It'll change the sonship in the last few chapters of this book, but right now it's fellowship. Because the Spirit, according to verse 27, teaches us all things so we can have fellowship one with another and, most importantly, with God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ because he, we have the same Spirit leading us into the same truth. False teachers avoid certain things in Scripture. Say what things? It depends. False teachers have a way of riding a hobby horse. They prophesy about sanctification or a special diet, but they neglect the whole message of the Bible. Jesus reminds us that we are to live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God in Matthew chapter 4. Every word. Paul was careful to preach, as he put it, all the counsel of God, the whole counsel of God in Acts chapter 20. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and all of it, therefore, is profitable. <laughs> this is one more reason, not that I needed another one, one more reason why we preach from the beginning of the book to the end of the book. You're going to get 1 John in its entirety. You're going to get every book that I'm blessed to preach at this place from the beginning to the end. We've done it with Galatians. We've done it with Ephesians. We're 17 chapters into the Gospel of Matthew. Where are we going to stop? The end of the book. And then you know what we're going to do? We're going to find another one. I got plenty of options. I won't run out of material, I promise. It's a big book. That's why you need the whole counsel of God. Yes, it is self-validating. I will give you that. But if there's something that any of us, myself included, are doing wrong, believe me, the Scripture and the Spirit will expose that error. We have to have the courage to repent, to change, Practices, change policies, to change as the Spirit and the Scriptures lead and indicate respectively. Now, this is what it all comes down to. Why? Why warn the church about false teachers? Why, why have this approach to book by book and all of this? Well, John closes this section with a reminder that all of us are going to appear before Jesus. In verse 28, he says this, And now, little children, abide in him. Why? That, when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. 
all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That's what 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10 says. And John, who's a, a pastor, who's trying to encourage and nurture his little children, those born-again ones that are part of the church family, he wants them as I want for all of us, for everyone under his influence to have a good judgment seat. You can't do that by listening to false teachers. You can't do that by having false doctrine. You can't do that when you've been led astray. The last thing I want for myself is to be ashamed. But John says that we can have confidence. Now, this has nothing to do with maybe we could have done more, maybe we should have done better. It's not about that. In context, if you stay true to the word and you abide in the message which you have heard from the beginning and you abide in the spirit and you abide in the light, you can have confidence that when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, you can hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You can have confidence. It's not a scare tactic. You can simply have confidence. So do you. You've run well. Continue to run on the straight and narrow way and found your life on the teachings of Jesus Christ. And you will build your life upon a rock. You'll know your Bible. You'll abide in the Spirit. And you'll have healthy fellowship with God and with one another. And you'll have confidence at the judgment seat of Christ. Father, we thank you for the word of your truth. Thank you that we can know you and have such confidence. And Father, I pray that you'll help us to abide in the spirit, to abide in the message which we have heard from the beginning, and to abide in the light as you are in the light. And God, we glorify you for this truth that we can live. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. I uh, want to remind everybody uh, that there is a ladies fellowship tomorrow night. As you can see Miss Lisa about that. It's going to be um, it's going to be at the Melting Pot in Wilmington. And uh, she has all the details there. If you have any last minute questions, uh, you're welcome to ask her. Uh, Yep, we'll go over that some other time. Also, the only other thing I'll say is that I know um, uh, some of you folks are thinking about the missions trip and uh, some decisions that are looming there. And so if y'all can just keep me in the loop at your convenience, I would appreciate that. Um, that way we can continue to, to make plans and, and uh, craft our agenda accordingly. And I believe that's everything, unless anyone's got any saved rounds. Nope. Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love and grace. I pray that you'll bless us with peace and comfort as we depart our way. Help us to go from here rejoicing, grateful for the truth that you've shared and for the spirit that we have. And God, I pray that you'll be glorified in our lives. Bring us back here to your house safely again this Sunday, that we may worship you once again together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Thank you.